Thank you for joining us and welcome to the conversation presented by the New York State Writers Institute at the University at Albany. My name is Paul Grandal. I'm the director of the Writers Institute. Before we introduce our guest today, Eugene Garber, let me mention that this conversation and all of our author interviews are archived on our YouTube page so you can view them at your convenience. You can also learn more about our upcoming programs on our website, nyswritersinstitute.org. You can follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And if you want to support future programming, you can go to our website, nyswritersinstitute.org, and make a donation. We'd be very grateful for that. So now, Eugene Garber and this forthcoming novel, Maison Christina, that we will talk about today. Um, let me say a few words about Gene and, and his illustrious career. He's a distinguished teaching professor emeritus of English at UAlbany. And he also has a deep connection to us at the Writers Institute. He served as our acting associate director in 1994 and 1995. As a writer, he's the author of seven books of fiction, including the story collections, Metaphysical Tales, The Historian, and Beasts in Their Wisdom, and also novels, including The House of Nordquist. Garber is a collaborator as well of the hypermedia web fiction project, Eroica. He's won several prizes for his writing, including the Associated Writing Program Short Fiction Award and the William Goyen Prize for Fiction. Gene, welcome. Right here. Thanks for joining us today. We go way back. I came to the university in 1981 as a graduate student. Uh, you were already teaching there. How many years were you at the university and what are, are some of your favorite courses or favorite memories of your long career teaching at UAlbany? Well, I came in uh, 77. So four years before you arrived, I must have sensed that you were on the way. So I hustled to get to the university to be able to welcome you there. <laughs> um, I came as the quote, founding director of the writing program in the Department of English there at Albany. Um, I don't feel much like a founder, but <clears throat> John Gerber was the chair. He and I had known each other well at the University of Iowa. And when he came here to try to rebuild the English department after the PhD was removed by state ed, um, he was looking around for new focuses in the department. And one of them was American literature and one was writing. So, he got me to come as director of writing. And there were some wonderful years uh, we, we had in place, although we had lost the PhD, a back doctor of arts. Right. And building on that, we were able to attract some really wonderful students. Later, the doctor of arts was transformed back into a PhD, but, um, yeah, those were wonderful years uh, from 77. Now, uh, you know, through the time you got there, I think yeah. when you, you must have sensed a good bit of vitality. I, I felt it was the golden age of the English department. Um, I had courses from you, I, Gerber, Garber, Tom Smith, uh, uh, Perry Westbrook, um, Hugh McLean. Judith Barlow, I could go on and on. It's great that I still connect to you and Judith and other of my former professors through the Emeritus Center, which is a really nice um, element of the university to keep our, our distinguished professors and our, our colleagues close to us. And we really appreciate how they come and support the Writers Institute. Um, but let's also talk about, I still remember this wonderful event you did with us when Robert Coover came. You introduced him and, and, and kind of interviewed him. And afterwards, you and Coover were telling stories again about a golden age at the Iowa Writers Workshop. You were there with Kurt Vonnegut, Donald Hall. There was talk of late night poker games. What was that time like for you just as a, as a writer, but also as just a person among these really interesting characters? Yeah, that was an extraordinarily interesting time. 
Um, and it, it was um, a time in which I finally got loose, so to speak, as a writer. I think this happens to a lot of writers. You crash around for a long time. So I'll make this short. My transition was, first, I was going to be a great Southern writer mm -hmm. in the tradition of Tom Wolf, um, Eudora Welty, Faulkner, and all those people. And I did, while I was at Iowa, write a uh, lyrical Southern novel, which is totally lost, thank God. <laughs> um, after that, I was going to be a, um, a good realistic fiction writer. So I wrote one of those. Neither of neither of those uh, genres were were working for me. So when you mentioned Cuba, when the wave of metafictionists, Cuba, Barth, Sukunik, William Gass came along, suddenly I realized there were things in fiction that I might be able to emulate. And I began to explore a more mythological, totally unrealistic way of writing fiction, which is, has served me well because I was not making it as a Southern lyricist <laughs> or as a hard boiled realist. <laughs> that territory had been well traveled. Um, but what is it about, and I want you to define metafiction because I know many people think of it in different ways, but I think of this hyper reality, you know, metaphysical, um, fantastical. What is it that, that, that draws you to that? Is it, like you said, does it free you up to, uh, you know, to go wherever your imagination roams without the confines of plot and character, etc.? Yeah, all of those, I suspect the central premise for a writer who thinks of himself as writing metafiction is that the stuff on the page is totally made up. It is not tethered to something outside of itself. It is not representing real life, etc. It may appear from the time, but um, I think there's a famous passage in Henry James introduction to the American edition of his novel, in which he says, um, he makes the distinction between the novelist and the tale teller and, and the, the romance writer. There's the romance writer has his balloon uh, and he takes a pair of scissors and he snips the toy and lets the balloon go. Mm. So, um, that's a kind of way of thinking of metafiction. And yeah. in the book <clears throat> that we're to discuss, uh, the storyteller, there are a lot of things you don't really know um, what the facts of the case are in that book. And I wanted it that way. Right. <clears throat> um, so we're going to talk about Maison Christina and appreciate it's kind of a sneak preview. It's coming out uh, next month, or actually October, <clears throat> excuse me. And, um, but you can order it online now. We're gonna add the link to this conversation where people can find the book. Um, but I wanna read um, some of the advanced praise, which I think sets it up so beautifully. This is from Joe Amato, author of Samuel Taylor's Last Night. And uh, he writes, is there a special providence in the gift of gab? Can a teller of tales lift the scrim of trauma, restore to the self something akin to soul? In Garber's holy cuckoo's nest, I love that, an aging seafarer of formidable wit, bedeviled by his own noisome demon, agrees to treat with words alone a fellow inmate whose mute convalescence shrouds a mind unmoored. But if this reckoning with potentially divine materials is to be a talking cure, the healer must himself be healed. Thus, the intellectual and spiritual stakes at the heart of this masterfully written and immensely entertaining novel. I think that sets it up beautiful. So Maison Christina is, 
Again, it's kind of mysterious. It's an asylum. It's run by nuns. What, what was the genesis of this novel? Um, yeah, that's, that's interesting. Um, a, a while back, I was reading a memoir by um, a former fellow faculty member, you probably remember, Rudy Nelson. Right. He was writing a memoir, and I found it fascinating. It was a story of his spiritual growth and transformation. And I thought, wow, I'd like to write a memoir like that. I thought about it and thought, no, this is not going to happen. And then I thought, well, I can do the next best thing. I'll write a kind of Romana play, like, say, D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Mothers. And I'll stick all of my autobiography in there and fictionalize it. And I got about 40 pages into that, passed it by a friend who mixed it. So I threw that away. And then I began uh, Maison Christina. And there the, the trail grows cold. I just started imagining it. Now, there's a ton of quasi autobiographical stuff in the novel. And I have to write a little essay called Fiction and Family and send it to my family to make sure that they understand <laughs> that the distortions of some right. real people in this novel right. are not meant to be savage and mean, but were fictively necessary. <laughs> Otherwise, they'll, you know, how much trouble writers get into exactly. when they use some personal material. It's like, you know, waving a red flag in a right <laughs> but you do you do have the historical connection i like there's a ms trask character in there and of course spencer and katrina trask uh the great uh, wealthy uh, rail uh, magnet family started yaddo the writer's retreat so that was clearly playing with writing and storytelling i assume that that's a historical precedent yeah and uh ms trask in the novel is obviously not a member of the great trash family. Right. She, she's imagining her whole past, her sister, her uh, brother-in-law, who's a kind of guru and god figure to her. So just like Naughton, the primary character in the novel, Miss Trask is telling stories in order to recuperate a cell. They're right. goofy as hell, but that's what she's doing. Right. <laughs> and and Naughton is is a brilliant wordplay and wordsmith. I mean, I think everyone would love to be able to tell a story like Naughton. He's in his 80s. He's had some drinking issues. He's had a lot of pain and brokenness in his life. And I'm you're never really clear. It's unsettling. Is this real? Is he just spinning these you know, fantastical tales. He's in this asylum where people presumably have, you know, uh, disorders and things. How do you, do you, you mean him as really kind of a, a, a theme of this, can story uh, redeem you or, or do, you, do you just put him out there as a real character? Well, as, uh, as Amato said in the, the passage that you read, it's a two-way street. Naughton tells stories in order to reconstitute himself. Right. And tells stories in order to awaken Charlene from her catatonic state. Right. So he, ha he has to do both at once. If he were to fail to reconstitute himself, he would not have any luck helping right. her out of her catatonic state. So the stories are absolutely the medium by which these two people are going to come back, so to speak. Right. And and there's a, a few nuns um, that are, are you know really uh, really kind and generous and and sort of uh, conduits for this this redemption and and this healing that takes place. Um, but Charlene is an interesting character. Um, 
Can you talk about how you created her? Because you're not really clear why she is in this state in, in, you know, in the beginning, at least. Yeah, I know where she comes from, but in those passages of early praise that I sent you, one is by Ricardo Nirenberg, right. who's looking back at the novel before this, The House of Nordquist, where there's another woman on the couch, so to speak. And as he points out in that novel, the demonic character is going to transform her into music. Right. In Maison Christina, um, Naughton is going to do the job entirely with words, with stories. But your question really is, where do these catatonic women come from? Right. I don't know. I don't want to think about it very much, actually. <laughs> when you write to your family, let them know that it's not modeled on any of them. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, the, the dialogue is so clever, um, mainly from Naughton. I was also reading and thinking it could be a play. Have you ever thought of it? Because it, it's, it's so, you know, the, the language is so crisp and clever and and deep have you ever tried a play that it was beyond I tried a, play a long time ago it was a terrible flop but there is something as you say theatrical about the novel because you are inside of one place for the entire novel now Naughton has the gift or the curse of looking at walls and his past comes back to him in little theatrical pieces there on the wall. Mysteriously, and I don't try to explain this, he's able to share those little pieces of theater with uh, Sister Claire, right. who uh, is a very perceptive woman, I think. And, uh, you know, readers might miss the fact that she's had to come from some dark place. At one point, Charlene, uh, in her naivete, asked Sister Claire, did God buy you? And Sister Claire says, no, I came to God a different way. How was that? I was reeking with sin, and I needed to get out of it. That's all we know right. of Sister Claire's past, except she thinks the little demon guy who shows up outside and outside the front walk, she believes he has invaded Maison Christina through crevices, so to speak, of her sinful memories. Right. Is she right? I'm not sure. Right. Did you at all think of, because in, in that blur, he kind of alludes to the cuckoo's nest. I, I did have in mind a little bit of Kesey's One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, McMurphy. I mean, it's a completely different setting and a different dynamic, but did that uh, story, you know, lodge in your mind at all? Because he, he also becomes this kind of leader to, to lead the... Uh, the troubled people, you know, somewhat out of themselves, but he, he doesn't have the same level of, of uh, verbal <laughs> skills as Naughton, but did you think at all about that novel? I didn't, but it's interesting you mention it because another friend whose uh, praise I might have quoted for you said, well, he picks up the novel, he starts reading, he said, I don't know whether I'm reading One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest or The Magic Mountain, uh, by Comas Mann, and he mentioned the third novel, but I can't remember what it is. <laughs> right. him, there's a kind of mixture of influences. I was not thinking of the Kesey novel. You might think I might have been. You know, I saw it out in Bellingham, uh, where Kesey visited with the Mary Pranksters and was a great hero there right. in the Pacific Northwest. And, uh, who knows? He might have been lodged in my subconscious, but I was not conscious. <laughs> Yes, 
I, I would love uh, if, if you have your book handy, if you could read a, a, a passage of Maison Christina to give our viewers a sense of, of the, uh, the amazing language and, and, uh, and wordplay that you have in it. Yeah, I'll read this passage. I'll just set it up a little bit. It's the first time that Norton talked in any length to Charlene. Charlene is sitting there, totally dumb, um, she can't shut her eyes, and she's obviously in terrible shape. Um, and he says he, the following thing uh, in order to uh, set up his work with her. Um, after a pause, Norton says, you like visions? Here's one. You're up on the highest wall in the world, Charlene, perched right on the edge. The sky is all around you. Not a blue dome, welkin, that kind of poetic stuff, because it doesn't matter to you if it's glowing or weeping. You don't care what your talons are grasping at the moment, scrabble, saxifrage, a sapling in a crevice, you depend on no such frailty. The updraft is ruffling your feathers. You feel the power. You move your telescopic eyes over the world below. Lots of quarry down there you could easily see. Wandering wobbly calves and kids, a neglected infant in a crib, fat pigeons, rabbit, downstream salmon washed up in the shallows, the whole world in your power. But you don't want any of that easy prey. You're after something bigger. Yeah, that's great. Um, and, and the novel begins with this kind of dream, strange sequence of, of uh, that this, carnivore this uh, bird pecking out this 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 corpse so it, it's this novel is is really interesting and wholly original and uh, and and the language and stories of Naughton are are so brilliant but I assume like all great writing that's many many revisions you don't just sit down and and, and one of these brilliant soliloquies come out of your your typewriter your computer i assume is it all in the rewriting to get that kind of beautiful language um, the rewriting uh, the revisions were very important and i owe a great debt to a former student of mine i don't know if you know him ron mclean oh yeah um ron has become a valuable invaluable reader of my drafts. And he um, made some observations that were important. The most important of this, the demon in the novel, Bulk, was just not working. I mean, is he now? I'm not sure. But uh, Ron's um, observations about Bulk were, were vital. And also some observations he made about the nuns and the the one priest who only appears as a kind of common figure. Uh, Ron helped me get that better straightened out. So yeah, the revisions were tremendously important. That's great. So you've been writing and publishing for many many decades. So you still. Uh, appreciate a good reader, a good good editor, which is really writers and editors at their best are, are like teachers and students, uh, I, I assume. Um, have you always gotten good feedback and, and followed your editors? Because I know some people that that completely bristle and, and don't want editing, and I don't think that's a good, a good formula. Um, so, so you accept criticism from readers and, and content and, and reshape it. You don't just, you know, um, 
one draft and only one way to do it. So you you do like getting editing and comments and. Yeah, I think obviously a writer. And I think of students I've had, but any student of any writing class, one of the things they have to learn is um, who to pay attention to or what to pay attention to. Writing workshops can set your hair on it because sometimes students say things to other students that are not going to be helpful. And now, if you perceive that as the moderator, so to speak, of the class, now you've got the job <laughs> of saying in a, a kind of nice way, don't uh, pay any attention to what John just said. <laughs> <laughs> because they'll wreck your manuscript. <laughs> yeah, so you have to be discriminating about whose criticism you take if you want. Right, right. Um, so, has your daily practice of writing changed? I assume you you go at it every day on on something, or will you now jump right into a new story collection or or novels, or, or do you write in spurts or? Yeah, I really do try to stay with it. Um, there was an unwelcome hiatus after I finished the book, and now I'm working with my publisher, and we're trying to get reviews and uh, blurbs and all that stuff. And all of a sudden, you uh, morph from a writer into some kind of marketer right. and it's a very uncomfortable situation now if i had achieved more fame i might have had a super agent a super editor and publisher uh, with a great advertising uh, and marketing department and all that i didn't so i had to work with my uh, publisher and also a young woman publicist uh, just to try to get some attention for the book and that that took a lot of energy and a lot of time and now it's over thank god and i don't know if any more reviews will come in or what but i'm through with it and i'm working on something else so yeah suddenly i'm back to life like norton <laughs> <laughs> that's great well the, the, the novel is maison christina published by Transformation Press. We're going to include uh, on this a uh, link to, to where you can order the book. Uh, we look forward to your continued involvement in the Writers Institute, uh, our book festival on September 25th. You've been, been there in the past. It's been a great event. Hopefully uh, we'll, we'll be able to hold when you watch this that there will be no announcements about going back to remote and virtual because all our students are campus. It's a, it's a full, busy, vibrant campus again. So we hope that uh, the high level of vaccinations and things uh, will, will protect us from, from any kind of new flare up in the Delta variant. But uh, it's been a great pleasure, Gene. It's good to see you. I look forward to seeing you on campus sometime soon. Well, it's been an honor talking to you and having my book mentioned uh, on your website, I assume the, the uh, tape will be up before long. Yes, we uh, look forward to, uh, to bringing some attention to it and some new readers to the wonderful craft of uh, Eugene Garber. Thank you very much, Gene. Thank you.